Our land acknowledgement this morning will not be limited to just the beginning of the service, as this is National Indigenous Peoples Day. Ideally, the acknowledgement is never limited to just this moment at the beginning of the service, but today especially we are incorporating elements of acknowledgement throughout our service. The Urban Indigenous Community Advisory Committee of the TDSB, Toronto District School Board, recently undertook a review of the treaty acknowledgement in consultation with a group of elders, Indigenous parents and guardians, staff and students, as well as other Indigenous partners and nations. Their priorities in developing a land acknowledgement were respect, presence, assertion, and recognition of Indigenous self-determination. They wanted this land acknowledgement to bring Indigenous presence and voice to Canadian society and its institutions, to create an opportunity for Indigenous students and staff to begin their day within their cultural context and to foster mutual respect and reconciliation. And as I recently heard on a Zoom meeting about anti-racism, we don't get to reconciliation without truth. And so let's begin with truth. We acknowledge we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And as we light the Christ candle this morning, we might consider the ways Jesus calls us to stand in solidarity with the oppressed. We might consider ways to challenge the living legacy of racism and oppression that came here with European settlers, which was woven into the very fabric of the society we have today. Especially those of us born into privilege have a responsibility to educate ourselves and to live actively anti-racist lives. This light of Christ is a fierce beacon of peace. And sometimes it takes patience to tend to this light. It calls us to be responsible in living in engaged peace, being vocal in spaces where we see that it is not being equally shared. And that peace calls us to live more than welcome. And I'm so grateful that you're here in this time to worship together. I am grateful for the ways that this story is connecting the stories and seasons of our own lives. And on this Father's Day, we acknowledge those who have been like fathers to us. We step into the images of faith shared in our traditions of the grandfathering of indigenous people and Jesus referring to God as Abba, Father. And today, I'm thankful for my father, for the ways that he showed me about relationships that heal and reconcile. And he received this stool as a gift when he served the Wada community. And it was made and given to him by his dear friend, Peter Franks. And I watched them as I grew share their faith with each other and grow and be changed because of their relationships. So I wear this stool today as a sign of honor and welcome, an invitation to you to this community that doesn't think or vote or love the same, but makes room to explore together what it means to be followers in the way of Jesus and to live that peace. We do that as a song of praise to our maker. It 
It's a song of praise to the maker. The thrush sings high in the tree. It's a song of praise to the maker. The gray whale sings in the sea. And by the Spirit, you and I can join our voice to the holy cry. And sing, sing, sing to the maker. Call of life to the giver when waves and waterfalls roar. It's a call of life to the giver when high tides break on the shore. And by the Spirit, you and I can join our voice to the holy cry and sing, sing, sing to the main. It's a hymn of love to the lover, the bumblebees hum along. It's a hymn of love to the lover, the summer breeze joins the song, and by the Spirit, you and I can join our voice to the holy cry, and sing, sing, sing to the maid. chorus of all creation. It's sung by all living things. It's the chorus of all creation, a song the universe sings. And by the Spirit, you and I can join our voice to the holy cry and sing, sing, Creator God, Great Spirit, we pray our thanks for the opportunity to gather in this sacred space. Here we are most aware of the gift of wind. And the four directions from which it comes. Here we are most aware of the gift of sun. and the four directions from which it shines. Here, we are most aware of the gift of humanity. And the four directions in which we exist. And here, we are most aware of the gift of creation. and the four directions in which we are living and breathing and being. This day we pray thanksgiving for the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people of Canada. Hi everyone and good morning. It's Michelle here, your Children and Families Ministry Coordinator. Today is National Indigenous Peoples Day. Today, all Canadians celebrate and honor the unique heritage, diverse cultures, and outstanding contributions of our First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And today, we wear orange. I now would like to invite all of our children and young ones for a time of godly play following the service at 12 o'clock. You can email me at michelle at islingtonunited.org in order to receive the Zoom link. We also invite all of our young ones to wear orange as a reminder that every child matters. We look forward to seeing you soon. More than welcome here, this 
National Indigenous Peoples Day, we wrestle with what it means to be a community of faith that preaches all are more than welcome here, a community who learns together and works for right relations. And this is difficult and complex work, and in the struggle we turn to the honesty of the psalmist. It is for your sake that I have borne reproach that shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my kindred, an alien to my mother's children. It is zeal for your house that has consumed me. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. When I humbled my soul with fasting, they insulted me for doing so. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the subject of gossip for those who sit at the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. With your faithful help, Rescue me from the sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Do not let the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. For I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to me and redeem me. Set me free because of my enemies. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. Psalms give language to our grief and prayers to the cries of our hearts. And as we return to this table to light candles of memory, today we honor those in our community who have died, 
those who you're remembering today, those who have taught us and lived lives of bridge building and peacemaking, those who call us to pray into our histories, our present, and our future. And so we pray for openness to hear wisdom from the elders, stories of residential school survivors and our part in the systems that have hurt and continue to hurt. We pray into compassion, healing, and reconciliation. We pray for the missing and murdered women, young girls, men, and boys. May they be wrapped in your arms of comfort. We pray for the families of the missing and murdered, that they may receive comfort in their loss. We pray for warriors who fight against the injustices that indigenous peoples endure. We pray they have your compassionate ear. We pray for strength and endurance for them. We pray just as the elders prayed for renewal and for the restoration of beauty to the land and its people. We pray for Mother Earth, the waters, the winds, for our siblings, the animals, birds, and fish, and all of life that surrounds us. We pray that we will walk the good red road of life, and we will take and walk with courage, honesty, humility, love, respect, truth, and wisdom. We offer this prayer in humility and hope, and in the name of our brother Jesus, the one who lights our path to wholeness, justice, and peace. Amen. Today, we turn our attention to the last chapter of the story. It's a letter from a pastor to his people in the midst of turbulent times. The book of Revelation contains one person's visions about the end of time. It reads like a compilation of dreams. Some Christians focus heavily on the details of this book to try and use current events to predict the end of the world. We hold this in tension with other creatives who have spent time musing on the end of the world. Whether it's Margaret Atwood's books like Oryx and Crake and The Year of the Flood, or movies like Armageddon, Terminator, or 2012. It's also in songs like 
It's the end of the world as we know it by R.E.M. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus proclaims, we know neither the day nor the hour. Lately, I've been in conversations where fear is palpable, and people have said, what is happening in our world? Are things falling apart? What are these signs of? Is this the end times? While we might not talk a lot about the end of the world and issues of faith around it, I wanted you to know that as liberal Protestants, there is a realm of theology and scripture that wrestles with just these issues. A whole theology exists around the end of time called eschatology. In Protestant theology, belief around the end of time uh, is founded on the idea, whether or not literal, that there would be a thousand-year reign of the saints. And this is based on interpretation of Revelation 20. And that this thousand-year reign would be a part of the process of the ultimate fulfillment of the reign of God. This idea is called millennialism. Beliefs around this have two polarities. Some tended to think that Christ would return to inaugurate this 1,000-year reign, and this is referred to as pre-millennialism, where Jesus returns as the millennium is beginning. Others tend to think Christ will return at the completion of this 1,000-year, and this is called post-millennialism. And people in this case would expect a growth of righteousness on earth leading up to Christ's reign. Premillennialists believe that this creation will be destroyed and that a new one will come to pass. Because the hope is placed on the new creation, these Christians have little care for how we tend to creation now. Postmillennialists believe that this creation will be renewed and transformed into an ongoing new creation. Because the hope is placed on the transformation of creation, working along with God, these Christians see the need to work in healing God's creation now. And we proclaim this post-millennialist theology in the Song of Faith, the United Church uh, 2006 Statement of Faith. We place our hope in God. We sing of a life beyond life and a future good beyond imagining, a new heaven and a new earth, the end of sorrow, pain, and tears, Christ's return and life with God, the making new of things. We yearn for the coming of that future, even while participating in eternal life now. Divine creation does not cease until all things have found wholeness union and integration with the common ground of all being. As children of the timeless one, our time-bound lives will find completion in the all-embracing creator. In the meantime, we embrace the present, embodying hope, loving our enemies, caring for the earth, choosing life. A grateful for God's loving action, we cannot keep from singing, creating and seeking relationship. In awe and trust, we witness to holy mystery, who is holy love. And today we are thankful to contextual theologians, to pastors, preachers, and educators, and communities of faith for helping us read Revelation in our time. And we read it anew today. We read it hearing the words from chapter 21, verses 1 to 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a groom. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among us. God will dwell with them, and they will be God's people, and God will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. 
And the one who was seated on the tr- throne said, see, I am making all things new. And also said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Herein lies good news. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy One, may we receive the grace and peace from you, the one who is and who was and who is to come. For blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this letter, and blessed are those who hear it and take what is written to heart, because the time is near. Between the words that are read and the words that are heard, may your word be known. Amen. So we hold a copy of the story in our hand. We pick up our scriptures and we turn to the last book in the story, the last chapter. It's called The End Times in this version. And it's that letter from that real pastor living in a real place at a real time under a real government, writing to real people in a real church with real struggles and challenges. It's that letter that John writes to them to encourage them to stay strong and keep going. Real people getting real help in the midst of trying times. Who doesn't need that right now? And when we read a little closer, we see that John is subverting the propaganda and the slogans, the politics of his day. He has written this letter with satire, with dangerous words and pointed language. It is sharp and it's quick and cuts to what matters. For the Roman Empire, well, it proclaimed that it was God on earth, that Caesar is Lord, and their path to this reign of God is military victory. They equate it with peace, and that peace comes with a price, with awful oppression and acts of evilness. But Christ, he shows up in this time and resists. He resists this example of peace, and he shows a new way, rooted in the conviction that the world isn't made better through military violence, but through compassion and sacrificial love. John saying to his people, I've seen who is in charge of the world, and it's not Caesar. Revelation is known as an apocalyptic book. For the first 1300 years, that's actually what it was called before it was translated to, tr- to be Revelation. It has its roots in the ancient Greek meaning of apocalypse. The meaning is to uncover, to reveal, to lay bare. Historically, it happened in times of upheaval. Not an ending of times, but a revealing of something. An end of the world as we know it. A passing of an era For once you see things, you can't unsee. Revelation is an intense seeing. And I wonder if we are in the midst of an intense seeing. And John isn't always sure what to write, but John is a poet. And sometimes a poem is as real as you can be. John uses a number of graphic, violent images and scenes in his letter because that's how life was at that time. And for many people, that's how life is in this time. John's encouragement to stay strong and keep going must match the intensity of the evil his community was experiencing. As Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber said this week, this in our time is no time for sentiment. Then and now, 
no time for sentiment. Now that we are waking up in new ways to our own racism, we cannot unsee. The healing work of anti-racism and reconciliation needs us to see. So we are grateful for musicians and artists and the poets who help us to see and to articulate what we can't unsee. So often, Revelation is connected to heaven. As Judas sings in the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, heaven is on our minds. And heaven is on our minds as we read the book of Revelation. But when we say heaven, which heaven are we talking about? Perhaps the most popular is the image from Revelation 21:21 21, 21, of an eternal city with gates of pearl and streets of gold. My personal favorite is Revelation 22, a beautiful garden on the banks of the river of life. And then there's that funeral favorite from John 14, in my father's house are many rooms. It's a kind of country mansion at the end of life's long and dusty road. Jesus often spoke of the life to come as a feast, sometimes as a wedding feast. And Isaiah 25, 6 to 8 portrays a sort of outdoor family reunion or mountaintop picnic with tables full of the finest foods and wines, a place for everyone at the table. In its own way, each one is appealing. And yet, a foundational biblical description of the afterlife that resonates for all of us comes from Revelation. Not from Revelation, but from Paul in Romans 8. Nothing, not even death, can separate us from the love of God known in Christ Jesus. It's more vague than a garden or a city or a feast but in it lies wisdom. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, a truth we know in our being and a truth we yearn for in the discontent and uncomfort when things are unjust and unright. It's a truth that we proclaim in the church. So today we set aside pointless arguments about what heaven looks like. So we can agree that this description of what is to come offers an overall sense of peace, of plenty, and of justice. A new way to see security. To an overworked, overtaxed, and oppressed peasantry, the promise of lots of food and endless rest must have sounded, well, heavenly in John's time, for all of us in this time, it also sounds heavenly. But sadly, powerful interests in the church and elsewhere have glossed over the bit about the eternal city coming to earth. They've taught the suffering poor to put up with hardship and injustice because God will put everything right in the sweet by and by. Don't believe it. The invitation today is to do everything we can to eliminate suffering in the here and now. Our scriptures call us to that. In the creation story, God made the world and God made us to live in it. In Isaiah 65, 20, it teaches that God intends we have a long, good life in the world God created. In John 3.16, it says, God so loved the world. This life here and now is important, and we should make the most of it, living how God yearns for us to live with love and compassion, living in the way of Jesus. Author Rob Bell names this in his book, which I will probably sandwich with the story if you're not sure what to read next. It's called, What is the Bible? How an Ancient Library of Poems, Letters, and Stories Can Transform the Way You Think About Everything. 
John was not writing a letter to his community to encourage them for a thousand years from now. He was writing to condemn evil, to call out injustice of those who use their power to oppress others, and to inspire all those in the thick of the struggle to stay strong and not lose heart, because love is a stronger force than anything aligned against it. And so we find ourselves waking up to this story anew. We find ourselves listening to the cries and needs of creation. We find ourselves listening to the voices that have awakened before us and call us to the work of Black Lives Matter on National Indigenous Peoples Day. We pay attention to the work of truth and reconciliation and the call to action in our own country and relationships with Indigenous peoples. We find ourselves in the now and the not yet. And you may feel that you're not sure what to do next or which way to go. But John's letter gives us permission to not do everything, to listen to the one thing or the thing for now that's being called out of you as we stand in the now and the not yet. Caitlin Bouchelon says, we live in that tension of the already and the not yet. We have been redeemed. We have been made new. We continue to be made new. And we belong to this kingdom that is for now. And we are just all walking each other home. As we face the future, moving through this pandemic together, waking up to what our neighborhood, our families, and our world needs, we have one foot in the now, and we're tempted to quickly write the story of the not yet. But today, the now is enough. A new heaven and a new earth is now. And for some, the now is more than enough, unbearable to think of the not yet, so we stay in the now. We do not know the future, but we are part of it following in the way of the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, for I am with you always. Let us pray. God, we hear the wisdom and the teaching of the elders, of the writers and the poets, the theologians, and those who live it each day, faith in action. And the sound of the river of life calls us to prayer. When we're not sure what to pray or what to say, we pause and let there be space to recognize our history and to awake to this now. And when we hear your call to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk together, we know that on National Indigenous Peoples Day, we commit as a community to do better. And as we hear the call to join those who have gone before and fighting anti-racism and paying attention to the stories out of the work of Black Lives Matter, we will do better. We will listen and learn and act. We pray prayers, O oh God, around families on this day, around the individual concerns and cries of our hearts, the places of grief and loss and joy and struggle 
the mundane, the ordinary, and the extraordinary. We pray that we'll see all of it as part of the new heaven and the new earth. The invitation to thrive and not just survive. We do this in the confidence of following in the way, oh God, of Jesus, who loves us like a brother and taught his disciples about the way of peace and justice. And he taught them to sustain it through prayer. And so we sing together now the prayer that he taught us. We give thanks to our national church body, the United Church of Canada, that's doing some of this work on the front line on our behalf. We are grateful that every time an offering is received that we're connected to that wider work and we also do this work together here. So as you make time to offer your offering, to place a check in the mail or to go online to the virtual offering plate on the website or an e-transfer to office at islingtonunited.org, know this is an act of peacemaking. And we're grateful for your courage and generosity for peace on earth begins with us. May it be so. on earth and let it begin with me.
Let us pray our offering prayer together. Holy One, take our offerings and use them. Transform them into compassion for others, community for the lonely, and hope for the church and the world. Amen. As we go from this place, I invite you not to go too far, for often when we would leave the sanctuary, we would head into Stuart East Hall for a time of sharing peace and hospitality. Just stay on the website where you are, and for a little bit longer, just give it a minute or two, and just scroll down, and underneath will be the video from the Facebook Live where people are joining me in real time. We'll be able to share words of peace and perhaps words or noticings from this morning's worship, what's sticking with them and on their heart as they're called into the world today. So just stay with us or come to the Islington United Church Facebook page and you'll find you can join live there. But you don't miss it if you stay on the website and scroll down just a little bit. We can't wait to see you there. And know that there are opportunities in these next days. We're having our first congregational Zoom meeting on the 24th of June at 7 o'clock, so you can find your way there to hear and be updated on what's happening in our wider church community. But know that the work of the church continues, and deep in our hearts, there is a common vision. In our hearts there is a common vision, deep in our hearts there is a common song, deep in our hearts there is a common story telling creation that we are one. a common purpose deep in our hearts there is a common goal deep in our hearts there is a sacred message justice and peace in harmony deep in our hearts there is a common longing deep in our hearts. There is a common theme deep in our hearts. There is a common current flowing to freedom like a stream. Deep in our From this place, 
held by the unconditional love of the Creator and following in the way of the one who risked for love. And may the wisdom of the Spirit guide you this day and always. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.